But in terms of a guy with a high upside, I mean, he really does feel like this generation Deshaun Jackson if he hits the ceiling, where it's like he's just a threat to have an 80 yard touchdown on a deep ball at any moment. And it's just the factor for him is becoming more consistent because, again, there were games last year where he just was a complete non factor and then it had two catches for 78 yards. You know, it was, it was just very, very sporadic and hard to tell which games it was going to be. So if he gets more consistent, he does have that big play potential that is pretty rare. What? What? Why are you shaking your head? You're welcome. Is Danny Dimes Danny Dunn? And do the Giants have a legitimate fantasy football sleeper in the backfield? I'm Joe Dolan, and I brought in Dan Duggan of The Athletic to answer these questions and more. Like this video and subscribe for more team breakdowns. 32 teams, 32 interviews. This is Franchise Focus, New York Giants. So, Dan, um, obviously the Giants did not make a move at quarterback in the NFL draft, and you know, there were some comments, uh, uh, Daniel Jeremiah made some comments that he wouldn't be shocked if Drew Locke outplayed Daniel Jones or ended up winning the quarterback job. And the question I have for you as a Giants insider is, is there reporting behind that? Or is that more of an opinion? And is that something where you could see an actual competition emerging for the Giants at the quarterback position? Yeah, and no, I mean, listen, that was a interesting statement. Definitely caught my ear. Uh, obviously, Daniel Jeremiah it was right after the draft too, so he's a guy who's plugged in and is, is talking to people. So I don't know, what, you know, where he heard that. Um, but there's been some smoke. You go back to John Schneider uh, right after Drew Locke left. He was on a radio show and he said that the Giants sold Locke on the opportunity to start, and the Giants very much pushed back on that. Uh, you know, Locke's introductory Zoom was the next day, and he said, you know, it's been conveyed to me that Daniel's a starter. So even that's just kind of funny, like, you know, NFL teams are all about competition. You bring a guy in, it's like, oh, yeah, everyone's got a chance to compete. But like, no, no, I have been told I have no chance to compete. That was a little almost like protesting too much. Um, however, I still think, you know, that Daniel Jones is going to be the week one starter. But Locke will obviously have a great opportunity this spring where, you know, Jones, they had their first OTA on Monday. He could, he participated in seven on seven drills, according to the team. But clearly he's not you know, fully cleared. So anything 11 on 11, they are no OTAs, mini camp. Uh, Drew Locke's going to get all those reps. Uh, you get the training camp. That's, you know, it's two months away. So by then, I would think Daniel Jones would be fully cleared. But if Locke makes a strong impression this spring, you can probably sell to start a camp. We're going to split reps just, you know, not to over, you know, overburden Daniel Jones coming back from the ACL. And again, so I think it's, you know, the, it is a competition at that point. Because if Locke plays really well, <laughs> then, you know, you can't just sit him if, you know, the other, you know, the other players on the team are going to see that. But I do think the word the Giants have used a lot this offseason has been expectation. And so whenever they talk about Daniel Jones, it's the expectation is that he'll be the week one starter. So they are leaving a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, but I do believe that's the case. Like, I think he'll be the guy. But I do think at least the door is cracked open for Locke to have a shot to wrestle it away. When Daniel Jones has played well, look, he's become kind of a punchline, right? Like the contract, oh, the Giants would love to have that back. But when he's played well, what have you seen from him that has been different than in the years where he struggled, especially this last year? Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I think the narrative swung a little too far. Like, we're not talking about like Zach Wilson here to talk about another, you know, New York quarterback. I mean, Daniel Jones has had solid seasons. I mean, his rookie year, he threw for 24 touchdowns. I think at the time, that might have been the record. I think Baker came on to, to break it or... I might have my timeline messed up there, but you know what I mean? He had a, he had a lot of touchdown passes as a rookie. Certainly CJ Stroud probably broke it last year. Um, but then the 2022 season is the season, you know, we're going to focus on because that's his last healthy season. That was his first year with Brian Dable. And now listen, he had 15 touchdown passes. So it's not as if he lit the world on fire that year, uh, but he, he was he had like five picks, you know, was an excellent game manager and the legs was really the difference fa making factor, especially if you're talking from a fa fantasy perspective, you know, like 700 yards rushing, another seven touchdowns rushing. So if that's the guy who you can say, like, was he ever worth a $160 million contract? No, probably not. But if you're looking at like what his upside is, it's this dual threat guy. Cause yeah, I don't think he's going to go out and throw for 40 touchdown passes at any point in his career, but if he can throw for 3,000 yards and 20 touchdowns and then also give you five or 600 yards on the ground with a handful of touchdowns, like that's a productive quarterback. And if he limits the turnovers, like, again, I don't expect this to be some explosive offense, but if it can back to that 2022 version where he's taking care of the ball, making plays with his legs, 
You hope that the offensive line is a little better. You hope that Malik Neighbors brings more of a game-breaking presence that they did not have in 2022. Like, that's the half-glass full outlook on, like, Daniel Jones and what this offense can be. Why Malik Neighbors instead of Roma Dunze? Why Malik Neighbors instead of J.J. McCarthy? What what was the Giants' rationale there in the draft? The J.J. McCarthy one's <laughs> that's a little more complicated because obviously uh, they did a ton of work on the quarterbacks in this class. It was well documented. They tried to trade up for Drake May, so clearly they viewed Drake May as a tier above J.J. McCarthy. Now, yes, um, you've also I, I think they liked J.J. McCarthy, but I think to take a quarterback at six, you have to love <laughs> that quarterback. So I think really what it came down to there is. You know, maybe if they're picking 20th and J.J. McCarthy was on the board, they would have been fine taking him. I think they just looked at the prospect that he is compared to what they believe they have in Malik Neighbors, who, you know, they haven't had a number one, number one wide receiver here since Odell Beckham Jr. Obviously, the LSU connection, there's a lot of parallels. They feel like Neighbors can be that guy. So I think they just felt like value-wise, it wouldn't have made sense to maybe force a quarterback who they didn't truly love. They feel like Neighbors can be that guy. As far as compared to Adunze, I mean, listen, you're talking about kind of six and one half dozen the other. It's pick your flavor. I mean, I think they're both going to be really good players. But I always zeroed in on neighbors as being the fit here because whenever Brian Dable or Joe Shane talk about wide receivers, separation is the first word that comes out of their mouth. Always. They want separation, separation, separation. So when a Dunze, I mean, he can separate, but you talk about his biggest strength, it's contested catches. <laughs> and when you talk about neighbors, it is. He's an explosive athlete, can get open, can create separation. So if they're both going to be great players and they're both going to have 1,500 yards, the Giants are still going to lean towards the guy who's going to get that separation because that's just what they put a premium on in their offense. So I think, again, they could both be amazing NFL players, but neighbors sort of fits that mold. I mean, they're coming from Buffalo where they had Stephon Diggs. I think there's some similarities there, whereas Adunze, again, is kind of that jump ball guy, and that's just not the thing they put the premium on, premium on in this offense. Who's the best receiver Daniel Jones has thrown to in his NFL career so far? Like, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to even really think of uh, of a great – because obviously Odell was gone by the time Daniel right. Jones arrived. No, I mean, listen, I, like, he hasn't played a game yet, but you'd think and hope it's going to be Malik Neighbors. Because, yeah, if you look at the cast he's thrown to in his career, it's pretty underwhelming. I mean, the steadiest guy has been Darius Slayton. He's led the team four out of the five seasons, and that's – you know, I like Darius Slayton, but not, a, not an NFL number one wide receiver – uh, there was a little Golden Tate where he had a, a pretty good year, one year with Daniel Jones. Sterling Shepard, when he's been healthy, has been kind of a, a go-to guy for Daniel Jones. But no, that's <laughs> that's been a part of the problem. They have not come close to replacing Odell. So now you hope Neighbors is that guy. But it's a little concerning that we're sitting here saying a rookie is going to step onto the field as the best receiver he's ever thrown to. But I think it's probably a fact. So let, let's then go to what they tried to do last offseason. And heck, by the time we publish this video, it might be irrelevant What's your read on Darren Waller and his situation? Yeah, so I guess it depends when this video will publish because, yeah, uh, it's been a long process here. Uh, you know, I spoke to him in March, and he said he hoped to have a decision soon. So I guess his definition of soon is different than mine because, you know, we're, we're two months more than that uh, away from that conversation. I spoke to him again uh, right uh, on day two of the draft. He had an appearance in New Jersey. I spoke to him then still kind of waffling so he's i think he's basically said i need to make a decision before training camp which i think that's that's a fair deadline to set at yes. least you know it's, it's dragged on this long um but yeah i don't think anything is like imminent you know he stayed away from the whole offseason program it'd be surprising if he just randomly shows up to like ota6 or whatever i think he's gonna um, take the spring do whatever he needs to do mentally to, to make his decision uh, everything I kind of seen and heard and just believe it's like, I think he's done. I don't think you can be on the fence this long. And then all of a sudden, like July 15th, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm fully committed. I know this is going to be, you know, the next seven months of my life, kind of living, breathing, dedicated to this thing that I just spent the last seven months wondering if I even wanted to do it. So I think that's where this ends up when that decision comes. My guess is sometime maybe as training camp approaches, uh, but I guess, you know, we'll see. It could it could come sooner. I mean, I think at this, at this point, it's like it's kind of time to just make a decision and stick with it. The Giants obviously let Saquon Barkley walk this offseason. And maybe, I, I don't know if they surprised you, but they surprised me a little bit. Devin Singletary got one of the healthier contracts for a running back this offseason. I believe they've essentially, it, it's essentially a two-year contract, but it means if you're signing a running back to a multi-year deal in this day and age in the NFL, it means you like the guy. Devin Singletary seems to me to be pretty locked in as the number one running back here with that contract. What do the Giants like about Devin Singletary? And 
why do you think they signed him to that contract? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to search too hard. I mean, Joe Shane was the assistant GM. And Brian Dable was the OC in Buffalo, and they used a third-round pick on Devin Singletary. So clearly they you know, were involved in that process and must have liked him, and he was on the team for a couple of years while they were still there. Um, I think you know, he's that next tier. I mean, obviously Saquon got you know basically double his contract for a reason. He's been a, a more dynamic, productive player. But Singletary's been a really solid back, and I think when you look at what the Giants are trying to do, where they're trying to kind of not be paying, uh, you know, a, a running back, you know, top of the market, that neck, they weren't going to just go like, oh, we're going to just patch it together with that minimum and day three picks. Like, I think they know they can't just have that position fall off a cliff because uh, as much as a lot of fans understand the, you know, running back being devalued and stuff, it'll be hard this season when they're looking down at the Eagles and if Saquon's tearing it up, if their running game is just terrible in New York, uh, that'd be a tough look. So I think they knew they had to make some level of investment. They just weren't gonna, they weren't willing to go um, to the place that Saquon wanted, but they still weren't going to just like neglect the position and just hope to patch it together with a guy like Eric Gray. They drafted from the fifth round last year, Tyrone Tracy, fifth round this year. I think they felt like they needed to get a guy who's proven to be a good NFL back. Like obviously not a great guy. I don't think he's had a thousand yards in many of the seasons, but almost like the Darius Slayton of running backs where it's like, he's a good, solid, productive yep. pro. And they're, they're willing to pay for that rather than just like trying to get by cheap with, with somebody else. And again, a known commodity. They're with him in Buffalo for a couple of years. So one of the things that Devin Singletary hasn't really done in his career is be a dynamic receiver out of the bank. He can do it, but he's had just two seasons above seven yards per reception. And that brings me to the guy they drafted in the fifth round this year, Tyrone Tracy. One of the, I, I think one of the kind of under the radar running back prospects, former wide receiver, um, just converted to running back really impressive tape what did the Giants say about him um after they drafted him and could you see him carving out a role as a rookie uh, as that receiving back yeah no I think that what they were looking for there was a, a dynamic type of running back I was not expecting them to take some plotting big running back there who's going to move the pile on third and one uh, I think they kind of have Singletary as the first down second down guy between the tackles and I think they wanted to add somebody with more of a big playability, kind of feeding into what they were, you know, the neighbors pick. Like they want guys who can make big plays. Um, you know, they were, when you look at, they were coming from Buffalo and you see what the Bills did in 2022. They took James Cook late in the second round uh, of that draft. Well, the Giants were sitting at the top of the third round there and they had shown a lot of interest in, in James Cook. Again, so that type of back. And I think that probably, um, Brandon Bean is probably aware that his former protege, Joe Shane, likes that type of back. So that's probably why Buffalo snatched him up when they did. But that's the type of back that they were looking for. Um, so, you know, obviously, Tracy gave him in the fifth round. Probably have to manage expectations a bit. But we've certainly seen, you know, rookie running back hit the ground running. Um, and I think he could definitely carve out a role as that receiving type of weapon. Because you talk about a guy who, you know, played wide receiver in the Big Ten for, I think, it was five years before transitioning to running back in his sixth season. So, if he was good enough to play wide receiver in the Big Ten, I think those skills would translate well as a receiving running back. Um, you know, he talked about after rookie minicamp, he was asked, you know, would you be standing here? Would, would we be talking to you as an NFL player if you just stayed a wide receiver? And he said no. And he pointed to the fact that, you know, some of the detriments of him as a wide receiver are actually strengths now that he moved to running back. Like he had decent speed for wide receiver. It's really good speed for running back. He didn't have great size as a wide receiver. He's got, you know, good size for running back. His receiving ability was obviously fine as a receiver, but it's a big plus at running back. So, uh, yeah, he's a guy that, like, it's always dicey day three rookies to project what the role is going to be in day one. But he's a guy I think you could see grow into having a role. And, and you know, ideally, you just kind of pencil him in as that third down back because, again, that's where his skill set would seem to translate. There's always a guy in the NFL every year where I look back and I look at the stat line and I'm like, boy, I do not remember that at all. And Wandale Robinson caught 60 passes this past season. And I cannot, I, I cannot process that because I follow the league so much. And normally Rondale Robinson's like, oh, he's out, he's inactive, he's questionable. But 60 passes, he played in 15 games. Is there a next level for Wandale Robinson as the giant slot receiver? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, you'd hope so because he did have 60 catches, but he, you know, he averaged like 8.8 .8 yards per catch. So it wasn't like he was like yeah. this big play merchant. He was really an underneath safety valve. Um, he did have a couple of bigger games later in the year. And I think that's what you're really, you know, seizing onto and hoping is going to be kind of you know, where he's building off of because he was coming off the torn ACL, um, made it back by, I think, week two or week three. He was back on the field, but definitely was not him, same self. 
And he's, he has said, that like, really took, you know, they always say this, like, it takes like a full year. So second half of the year is when he finally started to feel like himself. And if you remember when they played the Packers on Monday Night Football, the Tommy DeVito, like, the, the he had the the last drive, and there was a big play. Once there was a third down where Wandale was in the slot, and he just absolutely cooked a cornerback on, like, a corner route and got, like, a big 30-yard gain to get him in the field goal range. It was like, if you go back and watch that snap, like, the movement ability, the quickness, the shiftiness, like, that is special. So if like you can harness that and and get that to be, you know, using that all the time and making big plays, because again, there's a lot of check downs and short passes and five yard gains, but you see that type of play, you're like, okay, like there's something here. And he had a few of those where like he's he's super shifty. He's also also super small, so he's limited. You're not gonna, you know, not gonna throw the ball down the field to him. But if he can catch it on the run, 10 yards downfield, make a guy miss, you have a 25 yard gain. I think that's what they're hoping is that next level. Like I said, we haven't really seen it. The injuries have been a part of that. Um, but I think, yeah, he's going to be a, a big part of the offense. We said he had 60 catches last year. I would think that number is only going to go up. You know, the question now is just going to be more big plays than just kind of, you know, a little possession receiver. So uh, the, before I let you go, I want to ask about some lower end players on this roster who might contribute. And, and if one of these guys stands out, let me know. We talked about Darren Waller probably retiring. I think of Daniel Bellinger, and I think of the tight end they took in the fourth round this year, Theo Johnson, the really good athlete out of Penn State. And then also kind of a forgotten man, man who had some moments last year. Their third-round pick last year, Jalen Hyatt, the wide receiver. Any of those guys stand out to you as somebody the Giants would like to see step up as a contributor this year? Yeah, I mean, it was a tight end spot. It's like Daniel Bellinger, his rookie year before Daniel, uh, before Darren Waller was here, was like, you know, like 30 catches, 300 yards. I'm, I'm rounding it off. But, you know, it wasn't like any big time threat, but it was like a solid, reliable option. Um, and then Waller comes in, Bellinger kind of loses a lot of his targets because obviously you're going to feed the dynamic receiving tight end. But then Waller missed time, which is a big part of his story. And Bellinger, at the end of the day, his numbers were pretty much the same. Like, I think that's kind of who he is. Like, he's a tight end two, probably in a good offense, a tight end three. But he's like a solid tight end two, can block a little bit, can receive a little bit, not a dynamic guy. So I don't, I wouldn't think, like, for fantasy purposes, he's going to have some breakout year. Theo Johnson is the guy who I think has the ceiling to potentially be, you know, a big-time producer. Tough as a rookie day three tight end. Like, I mean, we've seen over time, you know, he, he referenced Kittle. That's obviously the gold standard if you're a, a later pick at tight end. Um, but I wouldn't expect from day one, year one, that's going to happen. I mean, you look at Theo Johnson's college production, it was minimal. Um, again, I think he's a guy who has the tools to potentially develop. But I, I would think year one, that's probably going to be a lot to ask. So the guys you mentioned, Hyatt is the one who, you know, you're talking about a guy who has flashes. Like when he made plays last year, they were big plays. <laughs> yes. uh, he just didn't make a lot of them. So, I mean, but the speed is undeniable. Everyone in the, in the building knew he was going deep and he still managed to get open deep. So that's the type of stuff that is like, you could have something there. And that's where you hope, when we talk about Wanda Robinson, then you talk about Malik Neighbors, it's gonna, you would hope, command a lot of attention. If Hyatt's one-on-one or the safety shading to Neighbors, that's where you could get big plays. I mean, Hyatt feels like one of those guys for fantasy purposes where you're going to have games where it's like one catch for eight yards, zero catches. And then all of a sudden it'll be like three catches for 150 because he just goes off and has two long touchdowns. Like, so he's not going to be the most uh, reliable guy probably week in week out, but in terms of a guy with a high upside, I mean, he really does feel like this generation is Deshaun Jackson. If he hits the ceiling where it's like, he's just a threat to have an 80 yard touchdown on a deep ball at any moment. And it's just the, the factor for him is becoming more consistent because again, there were games last year where he just was a complete non-factor and then it have two catches for 78 yards. You know, it was, it was just very, very sporadic and hard to tell which games it was going to be. So if he gets more consistent, he does have that big play potential that is pretty rare. If you want to get some insight into Malik Neighbors, check out Dan Duggan's work at The Athletic. Just wrote a big feature on him that is absolutely fantastic. He does cover the New York Giants for The Athletic, as mentioned, at DDuggan21 on Twitter. Dan, thanks for joining me on Franchise Focus, and uh, I hope you have a great summer, and we'll check back in later. Sounds good. Thank you.